Okay, so um, so it's been a long summer, first of all. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you guys again. Many of you i only seen a little bit here and there, really for the past two and a half months um, since we've been relatively busy uh, traveling. And I was teaching the class for a while, but soon um, I'll be transitioning on to, I believe, teach um, a young teenager class, basically. So, um, so I'll only have a few more times with you in here. And I was going through Elemental Faith series, a series on discipleship. And where we were uh, most recently was talking about the good life, um, this good life that we have in Jesus. And kind of a key passage that we looked at there, if you can open up your Bibles, is uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Uh, when someone gets there, can you read that for me? Uh-huh, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our, with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it and proclaimed it to you, that eternal, uh, proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manif uh, manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Okay. So, um, can someone also turn to the book of Luke? Um, Luke, starting in chapter 9, verse 23. Um, while we're turning there, so what we talked about before was this what. We talked about... Uh, what is this what? The way that John writes, John writes in his books very beautifully. Um, you know, he kind of leaves it as a surprise. He's leading up their suspense building as he talks about this thing. He doesn't name it for quite a while. He says, there was this thing. It was there in the beginning. We heard it. We saw it with our own eyes and we observed it. And we see that this what, it has substance, basically. It has this form, this powerful force. And John, he sounds so excited. He sounds so thankful and blessed to have experienced. So the question is, what is this what? What is this what that he's talking about? And we look and we go, oh, you know, he's talking about, is it, is it God? Is it, is it salvation? Is it, is it the Holy Spirit? What, what is the what? And this what, it's a very key concept, really in the, all of the letters of John, um, but especially here in 1 John, and that's life right? It's this eternal life. And it's the life that I like to call simply the good life. It's this eternal quality of life. When we think about eternal, oftentimes because of our preconceived Christianity, we immediately think heaven, right? We think good life, we go, oh, heaven, you know, holy mansion, streets of gold, one day we'll live forever. We think that. But when John talks about this eternal life, he's not just talking about eternity in terms of span of time. He's talking about eternal in quantity, um, in, yes, in quality as well as quantity. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's good in every aspect that we can imagine good. Does that make sense? It's eternal in every aspect that life can be eternal. So in the book of John in chapter 10, when he talks about how the sheep or how the shepherd, he guards those sheep. But the thief, it comes in to kill and destroy, right? But he says, I have come that they might have what? He says that they might have life, that they might have it in abundance, that they might have it to the full, that they might have this good life. And for us as disciples of Jesus, we're about this good life, right? This good life, it has its own substance and we live in it, right? We need to take hold of it, we need to love, love it, and we're about spreading it as well, right? Uh, to an extent, our mission, our great commission is paralleled with this command, right? As we look at Matthew 28, Mark 16, we're commissioned to go out and to make disciples of creation, right? And then we see, uh, we see in John 13, our call to love in this world, and by this, all the world will know that we are what? His disciples, right? So they work in tangent. There's this connection between our discipleship and the good life. Um, can someone turn to uh, Luke chapter 9? And uh, let me see here. 
and read verses uh, 23 through 25. So um, I thought that I had, I thought I was going to have a pen. I feel kind of silly now for assuming that. But um, it's okay. It's not a big deal. But if you find one, that would be awesome. Because um, I don't have good handwriting. It's kind of a joke when I write on the board to an extent. <laughs> but um, so as we talk about our discipleship, something happens along the way in our discipleship. Awesome. You have one? So as we talk about our, our lives as Christians, um, that means discipleship right? That's what we're called to. Jesus, when we look in, we look in Mark chapter 1, as he extends that call out, he says, come and follow me. This is the call to discipleship. And what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? This is going to be us. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Disciple. What does it mean? Where are we going? As we're called to come, we're following him, right? We're, what does it say in Luke that we just read? He says, daily take up your cross and you come and follow me. So it's a pursuit of Christ, right? It's a pursuit of Christ. Christ is the aim. He, he's the goal in all of that. You know, Hebrews 12 makes you think of it. It says, cast aside all of, your, all of your burdens and the sin that so easily entangles and fix your eyes on who? Christ Jesus, right? That example that lies ahead of us. So he's our pursuit. All of it is about following him. Following Christ. So discipleship, discipleship is what we do, right? And where is the good life in all of this? The good life, the good life is this beautiful side effect, <laughs> this beautiful side effect that gains substance along the way. Where he says, as we carry this cross, it's about losing ourselves, humbly giving up all of our own wants and desires and seeking first his kingdom, right? And he says, as you do this, as you lose yourself, what will you find? What do you find? You find life right? You find life. So I, I hope that, I want to, I don't, just want to point out real quick that these things, they happen somewhat simultaneously. As we, as we give our lives up to following him, something's going to happen. And as it happens along the way, as it goes along the way, it's going to be like with what John talked about, where we should be able to point and look and say, there's something that I'm hearing here. Um, there's something that I'm seeing. Uh, we're starting to notice that things are happening that are not from us, right? There's this good life, and it should have this substance, this form in and around and through and among us, right? Uh, we sing many songs like this. Um, there's the, the song, Have You Seen Jesus My Lord, comes to mind. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here in plain view. You know, take a look, open your eyes. Is he there among you? So it's not just Jesus is our pursuit, the good life, is in all of us, and it's happening among us. It should be, it should be happening. And I'm going to say, Scripture shows us that it can only happen as you pursue Christ and the cross. Uh, but many times we, we take a look at our Christianity, and we take a look at our lives as Christians, and sometimes we feel a little gypped. Um, sometimes, like what Glow mentioned today, we think about our lives, and we look at the church, and we're like, oh man, people don't want to come to church. They say it's boring. <laughs> You know, they don't want to come. It's hard to get people to sit. How do you get people to sit and, and listen to a whole sermon? And now they've got cell phones, and, you know, they want to use their Bible on their phone, but you get Facebook notifications along the way. It's like, how can you get them to pay attention during all of that? You know, it's like, ah, oh, now, too, there's all these sports, and people want to watch TV, and people are tired. Don't you know we have to work really hard um, to make a living? And then, pff, don't even get me started about family problems. You know, how do you get people to have good and healthy 
family lives and to be good parents and to be good mothers and, and, and talking about marriage and, and all these things, you know, and how do we get people to be interested in, in studying the Bible? It's so old, <laughs> you know, at the newest, what, it's 2,000 years old? Come on, you know? Um, how do we get all these things taken care of? And if we're not careful, much of our Christianity becomes, you know, looking at how do we solve all these little problems? You know, how do we get how do we get cool programs going? How do we get people to come? How do we get them? How do we get them to want all these things? And all these questions come to mind, right? And sometimes we have a lot of answers. You know, um, for me as an American um, or a Westerner, I think in a problem-solving kind of way. You know, so I think, oh, you know, kids aren't having fun. Boom, new kid program. I don't know. Get them a blow-up inflatable. We'll talk about Jesus. He'll come from a rocket ship, and he'll teach a sermon on the mount. It'll be awesome. Kids, they'll love that. You know, and it's like, oh, no, we got a marriage problem. Boom. We'll have marriage family retreat. It'll be awesome. We'll get this guest speaker. They know they've been married for like 30 years. People love them. You know, uh, they're really great with couples, and they'll come. It'll be great for our, for our marriages. You know, oh, you know, what about our new Christians? We don't have, we don't have any kind of program happening for our new Christians. Boom. New Christian class, we've got, look, we've got this missionary that just came through. He uses this study to teach all of his new Christians. And we're, boom, new Christian program. Boom, 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 boom. There's all these little things, right, that we start doing to try and to help this problem that we see sometimes of how do we just get the church to grow? How do we, how do we, how do we get people to have this heart for God? So we start to look at all these issues, and it reminds me of uh, a problem that we just have in the world, um, and maybe in our work lives or business lives, uh, dealing, dealing with issues. I have a little, uh, a little picture here. Sometimes, as we see a problem, it takes a while to look and see what the real problem actually is. You know, sometimes we might see, you know, we're walking along the beach, for example, and we go, you know, we're off in the distance, we go, oh, there's a shark. It's kind of weird that a shark is just kind of dead there on the beach. That's unusual. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they were fed strange things. Uh, there's weird things out there. We need to look at what's killing, what's killing all these sharks. And we see, oh, there's like birds dying as well. You know, what's going on with that? There's kind of some goo and some stick. And we start to see, you know, the water is looking a little strange. Maybe we need to find out how we can better treat the water, how to take care of that. And then we realize, oh, you know, tourism. For some reason, tourism along the beach has just been really hit. People don't like all of the nastiness going on. And, and maybe we just need to promote better tourism to Alabama, to, to Florida, to get more people to come because uh, they're not having fun with all this going on. We can look and we can kind of address all these surface issues. But what's the main issue that's going on here? It's oil spill, right? <laughs> problem is the oil spill. And I don't want to get into a uh, environmental, political conversation about oil. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, sharks dying itself isn't the problem. Water looking at strangers isn't the problem. People not wanting to go to the beach isn't the problem. Ducks getting stuck in goo is hitting closer to home. The problem is oil spill out in the ocean, right? That's the problem. That's the big problem there. And for us in the church, I feel like sometimes we raise up our hands looking at all these different things we're missing we're missing what god has called us to we're trying to micro hit all these different things when he's wanting us to look at and to focus on making disciples um can you turn with me to the book of matthew chapter 28 I'm really struggling with my Bibles right now in life. Personally, I just have a little confession. I'm in between trying to use these Thai English Bibles. None of them are the translation I like. And then I'm generally very used to my personal Bibles. I like to know where things are exactly. So when I turn Matthew chapter 28, I'm like, boom, that's the middle of my right side page. But these are just so alien, so I'm really sorry about all that this morning. Um, and then the translation's all weird. They're not the same translations that I use, so please just bear with me while I jumble through all these Bibles. But Matthew 28, I love what we have here. Just like what, what Gloom mentioned, we have this commission, this plan of God coming to fulfillment. This is the same plan in reality that Gloom was talking about as Moses 
was traveling in that little basket, that little boat down the river, um, that same plan is being carried out here because it all had to do with bringing the church to this world, right? Um, in order to do that, God chose to empower, um, he chose to empower these 11 uh, men. And it says here, it says, verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. It says, when he saw them, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Authority means what? Yeah, power. What else? Power, the right. Huh? Yeah, leadership. I think ability. Um, if you have the authority to do something, do you need to wait? You don't need to. If you're, if you're the one in authority, do you need permission? No, you can do it. You've got, the, you've got the power, you've got the means, you have the ability. He has all authority. He says, it's all been given to me. So it says, therefore, therefore, because of this, because I have all authority, I have all power, I have all ability, he says, I want you to go and make disciples of the nations, of creation. And he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He says, you teach them to obey everything that I've commanded with you. And he says, no, he says, and look, behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we see this commission, right, to go and to make disciples of the nations. And this is what he's done in him having all power. It, the way that Matthew describes it, it's very similar to what we see in John. Uh, let's just turn there, actually. In John chapter 13. As Jesus is about to wash the disciples' feet. In verse, uh, chapter 13, in verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Uh, the evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his what? Power. Under his power. And that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. Um, and he was getting ready to serve, right? I love the way that John sets the scene, right? He tells about, you know, the Passover is coming. It's this great grand feast. It makes you think of Christmas um, for us, you know, and he says, Jesus, he was looking forward to this time. And he says, you know, the devil's already, he's already twisted the heart of Judas. Judas knows what's going to happen. Jesus in just a few hours is going to die right? And it says that Jesus, he knew. He had this new understanding. We don't know, we don't know how much Jesus always knew because he was God in flesh, right? But he was still a human. Uh, he wasn't all-knowing in the way that God the Father was all-knowing. But right now he knows. He says, I know that I came from heaven. I am the Messiah. He's fully aware of this, it says, at least at this point. He knows now. And he says, I know now that all authority and power has been given to me. I love that. And he says, so what does he do? He gets a towel to serve, basically. But we see that same kind of grand cosmic awareness that Jesus now has here at the Great Commission. He says, he says I have all of this authority and power. He says, so I want you to go out and to make disciples of the nations. Make them of the nations. We've talked about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in here before. And as he talks about, I want you to baptize them. I want you to fully submerse them um, into my possession, belonging to me. Uh, with some of you, I'd like to talk with you more about what that means in baptism. As, we, as we're baptized into him, we become owned by God. And he says, I want, he says, I want you to sign them off to the name of the Father. They'll belong to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, property of G-O-D. Um, he says, and you teach them to observe everything I've taught you. 
Um, I love in some translations, um, they break it down and maybe it's easy to read English or Thai Bible. Um, it will simplify that to say something like, teach them to care about everything that I've taught you to care about. You know, make them, uh, show them how to live just like how I've taught you to live. Show them what following me looks like as you yourselves follow me. And this is a very key part of this passage. It's one that we often forget about. Sometimes we look at the Great Commission, we just think, teach them about Jesus, baptize them, boom, it's done. That's not discipleship. That's not making disciples. That's making converts, which isn't the same, right? I come from New Mexico uh, in the United States. We have a long, old heritage. In New Mexico, we're very uh, culturally proud of, our, of who we are as Nuevo Mexicanos. Uh, because to be New Mexican is a little different than just being another American. You know, we're not like the Texans. They have their own history. We're not like the Arizonians. We have an old heritage that goes all the way back to Spain itself. So many of our cities predate America's cities. Uh, we have many tricentennial cities. Um, so if you call, if you call a, a New Mexican sometimes, when they come from this original Spanish heritage, you call them simply American, they go, oh, you know, I'm a little Mexicano. My family, you know how long my family has lived in this land? You know, they'll be offended uh, because they have this special heritage and who they, who they belong to. Um, and us, you know, they, they want to pass that on. They want them to others to know where does they come from. Uh, and Jesus, he's saying here, I want you to pass on this heritage that I've shown you in the three years that I spent with you. Um, but that takes time. It takes time. Uh, for, the, for the Spaniards, when they first went to the land, uh, when they first went, there were times, you know, in colonialism, uh, a lot of it was called missions, right? <laughs> it was missions. In long run, it looked like war with quick dunkings, right? Is this discipleship? No. It made a lot of quote-unquote converts, right? A lot of people rallying under the banner of Christianity. We see this also in around 3000 AD as Christianity becomes the popular religion in Rome, right? You know, as everyone becomes Christian, you know, as you make everyone Christian, do they become disciples necessarily? No. Because the issue, like we talked about before, as we look at all these questions, you know, you can never get people, you can't make people change their heart. <laughs> it's a matter of our heart, right? As we all have choice to choose and to follow Jesus. What we can do is live and model that example. Um, so, in talking about discipleship, uh, this pursuit of the cross, um, there is something that needs to happen, I feel like, that, that we sometimes miss, and that's our role in community. Uh, we talked before the series Elemental Faith, and we didn't quite get into this. We'll get into it next time I teach, I teach in here, but is that God himself God himself was already a God in community, right? Um, there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We looked at in Genesis, as he goes and he creates man, he says, let us make man, right, in our image, which is a really strange and unique thing where we see that God, although he is one, uh, he lived in this community. And we as Christians, as we come to this family, uh, we join this community. We talked about this a little bit before to where John talks about this in 1 John 1 verse 4. He says, he says I, hope, um, I hope that others can join and others can experience this good life. He says, so that our joy may be made complete as we grow in this community. And I mention this because discipleship is a community event. It's a community affair. Um, discipleship happens in community. Um, it's not just about my personal pursuit of the cross. It is that, because that's what it means for me myself to be a follower of Christ. But for me to do that, I need others around me. This is why Jesus, he spent time with how many men? How many men did Jesus focus on training? There were the 12, right? Um, there were 12 men. And below that, uh, there were even a smaller crowd. Anyone know how many? There were three or, there are about three or so, right? You can maybe say four. Um, that Jesus especially dedicated time to. And, you know, he, he went out of his way to enter their world. In John chapter one, it says that Jesus, 
he took up residency among us. Literally, the Greek says he pitched up a tent with us where God looked at mankind. He said, I want to go and to spend time with them so they might see my life and see what it means to live out this good life. What does it look like to live the good life? So he came and he spent time with 12 especially, and he spent time with these other three. And it takes time. Discipleship isn't something that can happen in classrooms like this. I can talk about discipleship all day, but really needs to be shown, right? It's not something that can happen in our worship service. <laughs> it's not something that we can do a, a VBS or we can do a seminar and, and show and see discipleship. Uh, it needs to be modeled for us by example, right? As Jesus, he called these others alongside of him. So um, for us, I want us to think about, uh, I think sometimes in the church, we oftentimes, we oftentimes aiming for really good things can miss discipleship. I think that one of the biggest tricks that Satan does is he gets us, uh, he gets us caught up and distracted in all these little problems, right? And kind of looking at our lives in Christ says, oh, we've got to address all these issues. We've got to see, we've got to look at all these different tasks, and we've got to be sure to do all the different things that, that God is calling us to do, and we can miss, we can miss what's important. Uh, turn with me to the book of Luke. I think this is right. Luke chapter 18. Let's see here. In uh, Luke 18, can I get someone to read... Um, Verses 18 through 30. Okay, can you stop right there for a second? So we see this guy, he comes, and what does he want from Jesus? What is he wanting? He wants eternal life, right? Uh, he says, Jesus, tell me how I might have this eternal life. Um, sometimes I feel like uh, in Christianity, you know, we want the, we want the quick road at times. He says, tell me how I get that. Tell me how I get that, that mansion, this, this good life that you're talking about. I want it says, how do I get it? Um, so what does Jesus answer? He kind of questions him. Jesus, when Jesus asks questions, they're, they're tricky. <laughs> you know, he's trying to get to hearts of the matter. Just like Jesus, you know, he says, uh, go call your husband. <laughs> you know, it's a trick. It's a loaded question, basically, Jesus is asking. Um, so in the guy, he goes, he goes, oh, the Ten Commandments? He goes, you're saying the good life is just about the, he basically thought already the good life to get eternal life, I just got to keep the rules. And what does he say about the rules? He says, I've kept those since I was a kid, right? He says, ah, oh, Jesus, he goes, the good life is just about following the commandments. You know, it's kind of, I feel like as he heard this, it was a relief. <laughs> you know, as he, as he hears this, he goes, you know, how do I get this eternal life? I've heard heard things you've been teaching about the kingdom of God, heard things about eternal life. How do I get that? Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. He goes, oh, great. He says, I'm a pro at that. <laughs> that's, that's like cakewalk, piece of cake. Ty say, goy, goy, banana, banana. Um, but, but there's a catch, right? It's a little bit more than that. Can you keep reading? Verse 22. Mm -hmm. Jesus heard this. He said to him, <clears throat> one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Okay, can you stop there? So he says, go and sell everything you have. <laughs> go sell it all. You know, at first, as he first hears it, he hears, you know, he's thinking rules, right? He wants to know the formula. Sometimes we want that. We want the shortcut. I'm like this. When I learn things, I don't like, I like learning. We were just talking before. I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. If you know me, you'll know this. I, I can learn things all day long, but I want the shortcut. You know, if, you know, I'll read the big book if I have to, but if there's a brochure version and that's good enough, give me that. <laughs> I don't, you know, why waste time with all this over here? He's after the same thing. He goes, okay, it's about the rules. That's easy. But Jesus wanted to get to the heart. He knew, he knew that his heart wasn't there. 
It says, go and sell everything that you have. Can you keep reading there? But when he heard, uh, we, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So, Jesus' question for him, and we see this many times in the gospel, is where is your heart? Where is your heart as you claim to be following Jesus? As you claim to be seeking the kingdom, is your heart really there? Because if it's not, it's going to show, right? Um, so here we see this story. He goes away, he goes away sad, right? <laughs> we don't know exactly what happens, but it seems like he just couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it, basically, because his heart wasn't there. Um, his heart wasn't ready to give up what it needed to give up. Um, he says, uh, in verse 29, it says, I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one has left home or wife, brothers or parents, children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. He says, you know, all of you that have sacrificed, you're going to receive much, much more now and then. At, at one point, I feel like we thought that it was all about then. Um, it was all about, oh, one day, you know, I'm going to get heaven, basically. And that sounds awesome, right? But he says, now and then, we get the good life. Uh, it's this beautiful side effect as we give up everything in pursuit of him. But it's a challenge. We need to stop and ask ourselves, where is our heart? Is our heart ready for that? Is our heart really committed to being a follower of Jesus? Um, in scripture, they use this term disciple. And disciple sometimes is hard for us to translate in our world today because in many of our societies, we don't really have a good match, right? As a student would become like, the rabbi is what they would say. Because being the rabbi, it wasn't just about learning the things that the rabbi was teaching, right? Being a disciple of a rabbi meant you become like that rabbi, right? Um, for us, some of us, some of us, we might have uh, uh, professional uh, role models. We might have people that we look up to in our fields of interest and in our hobbies. Um, I think basketball. Who are some great basketball stars? When we think about playing basketball, who do you want to play basketball like? Like Kobe Bryant, I just saw a thing uh, last night about LeBron James and uh, and what is the guy's name? Oh, I can't think of his name. He's old. He's old now. But uh, not. Jordan. It wasn't Michael Jordan. Yeah, but Michael Jordan, great stars. Uh, you know, we think about oh, no, I want to be like them. There was the, there was a slogan. I want to be like Mike. Um, I don't know if you remember that. I want to be like Mike. It wasn't just a, and sometimes it's a problem. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's a problem because it's like, you know, you can play basketball like them, but don't, please don't live like Kobe Bryant. <laughs> uh, you know, but really, people, they model themselves after them. They say, no, I want to be just like them. You know, if I dress like Mike, if I, if I eat like Mike, if I wear Hanes shirts like Mike, maybe I can dunk like Mike. You know, probably not. Uh, but do we have things like that in our, in our society today? Not so much. The thing that I think of in my head is, the Kung Fu disciples, <laughs> um, as they go to the Shaolin Temple, which is a real thing, it's not just made up in like Kung Fu Panda, but as these disciples, they give up everything, you know, to go and climb this crazy mountain in China, and they say, I want to learn all there is to learn about Kung Fu, and they give up everything, right, to become like their teachers, and this is what it means to be a disciple, it's you give up everything, you give up all of it, the disciples, they left all they had, they left friends, they left their families, to follow him, to become like this Jesus. So for us, I think something we need to consider is, are we, are we living as disciples of Christ? That's a big, Big C. Are we living as disciples of Christ? Uh, some of the things that we mentioned before as you talk about just issues and problems in the church, 
if we're living, so we're living out as disciples of Christ, uh, as we're living out as disciples of Christ, these issues, um, all these things are going to be coming together. As we're calling others to pursue that cross, when we make mistakes, um, we can humbly admit, you know, I'm just someone that's trying to strive for Christ in my own life myself. Um, if we get others to see, you know, this is a matter of heart. Where is your heart? Uh, we can call them to give up their lives to Christ as well. If we're not following him, if we're not following him, how can we call others to do it? We can't, really, right? We can't. I've told some of you how, um, told some of you how when I was young, I'm really thankful for the time that others, they sacrifice in entering my world um, to disciple uh, to create really opportunity and space for me and my friends to be discipled. It was a trendy thing in America at the time um, to have, uh, for churches to do this, and my church was new, a part of it, um, but was in building skate parks because they realized, you know, some wise church leaders realized, you know, a lot of our kids are into this uh, subculture of skateboarding and whatever, and really they get into a lot of trouble, and I did, <laughs> you know, and they said, as they go out into the streets, you know, they're fighting with cops, they're fighting with security guards, they're fighting with whatever, and they'll just get angry, they're young and foolish, and it was true. <laughs> you know, most of our afternoons were chasing, uh, chasing and running away from mall security and, and police, whatever, to skateboard on the street and to rebel against the man, right? Um, so churches, they said, what if, we, what if we use this area? Look at how big our parking lot is. What if we use this space to let them build ramps? And they could legally do the things they're wanting to do out there here. And as they come together, we can have Bible study with them. And we can, you know, instead of them being out there in the world among the gangs and the drugs, they'll be here with us. Um, and we can let this be about the good life. We can show them what it looks like to be a disciple and a skater. Um, I'm really thankful for that time where where they showed and lived example in front of me. And it was about creating space for that to happen. Um, so my next question is, you know, are we, are we living as disciples of Christ? And my next question is, just like we talked about Mother's Day today, are we mentoring, are we discipling others in our life? Are we making disciples? Are we making disciples in our lives? As we talk about that pursuit of the cross, as we experience the good life, um, it's something that happens as we do these things, as we take time away in our own life to spend with maybe two or three or four other people. And as we pursue that cross, we humbly call them along our side to do the same thing. Um, sometimes it takes creativity. Um, like my friend's dad <laughs> uh, buying a skateboard. Really not to skate all that much with us, just to create time where we can go skateboard with older Christians um, that knew how to deal with the things in life that we we're going to be encountering. Um, you know, are we finding time to do this? If we're not intentional about it, if we don't aim for discipleship, we don't get it, right? As we aim for those other issues, discipleship will be left on the side burners and where will our heart be where is our heart um, so what i want to think about is are we are we dedicated to these things is my life a life where i can humbly call others to follow along christ as i'm striving to follow him am i looking at other people's example ahead of me older wider christians my kun mat in the faith um, and following christ and am i an example where i'm spending time with others to challenge them in their own walks as disciples. And these are things I want us to consider and to reflect on um, as we think about as we think about our discipleship and especially this community. Because I believe the model that we have from Jesus is that it happens in community. We saw him with the twelve and we saw him with Peter, James, and John. He spent time with a few of them. Uh, sometimes we sometimes we talk about, oh invest all our time in one. Some of the things happen, right? Um, as we think about Peter, James, and John, what if Jesus spent all his time dedicated to James? You know, it's like, oh, you know, the 12 are really good, but James, he's the one. You know, he's going to be doing that announcement as the kingdom goes out. Boom, he's the one. What happens to him? What happens to James and Acts? 
dies. <laughs> dies quickly, right? You know, he was one of the three. Jesus spent a lot of time with him. Sometimes this happens. You know, sometimes we disciple others, they'll fall away fully. They'll fall away at times. Uh, sometimes we are like this. You know, we need others to draw us back, like John Mark. Uh, but we spend our time with several. We invest in a few. They can grow together and alongside one another in our pursuit of the cross. Um, so I hope that for us, we realize and that we can come to know and experience this good life um, that happens in our pursuit of the cross. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, like Jesus says, it's a huge blessing. It's our life, but at the same time, it costs everything. It's a challenge of our heart. Uh, is our heart really in it? Is our heart really there? Um, he says, as we do so, you will receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Um, I want to lead us in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Father God, God, I thank you for this time that we're able to, to talk and to take a look at your word, Lord. And God, I thank you so much for this church family um, that is uh, such a flexible and loving body. Uh, and I think it's a beautiful thing and really an unusual thing where so many of us can come from different backgrounds and different, different nations, nationalities, skin colors, um, professions, God. And yet uh, we're united together as one family um, in you, God. Um, Father, I pray that you continue to help lead us and guide us as a church um, where we're thinking about how it is that we're building up the body. Um, I pray that you help us to, to look at and to see uh, as important what you see as important, God. Um, Father, I pray that you help us to give our hearts and our lives to you. Um, it can be a scary, a scary thing, just like we saw the, the ruler um, see where uh, there's certain things in life at times we don't want to give up. Maybe it's our wealth, maybe it's our family, maybe it's our personal time. Uh, maybe it is our, our fears, our wants, our desires, and we pray that you give us the strength to give those things up because we know that as we do, we'll be blessed abundantly more in you uh, with the eternal life that comes from your son. God, I pray that you give us strength uh, to be your disciples. We know that your son, Jesus, he is with us always, and I truly believe that. We have nothing to fear. We know as you are on our side. God, I pray that you prepare beautiful things ahead of us, um, things that, that we know that we'll have to have faith in you um, to accomplish through you, God. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you invade us in our lives um, so that we can see God at work in the world around us, and so that others can see um, the church as a shining light in the darkness. Uh, we love you so much. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son and his embodiment of what love is uh, and giving up his own wants and desires uh, for the sake of others. I pray that you help us to have that same kind of love for others as well. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen.